Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order this uh, Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights and Engagement Committee for Monday, October 22nd, 2018. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I have the proud honor of serving as the chair of this committee. With me at the dais are Council Members Cano, Gordon, and Council Vice President Jenkins. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have eight items on today's agenda, including a public hearing on the Small and Underutilized Business Enterprise Program Ordinance. And, but we will begin with a, going through the consent agenda items, and then we will move to the public hearing, followed by then the discussion items. We have a big agenda today, which is, I'm glad to see so many folks here. Um, so first, we have on the consent agenda, we have, let me see, the Southside Green Zone Council, the passage of the resolution, and also directing the Office of Sustainability to issue an R RFA for $75,000. And then for number, uh, excuse me, for the second, we have the passage of the resolution reconstructing the Minneapolis Community Environmental Advisory Committee, the SEAC. Number four, we have the neighborhood name change, the Calhoun Area Residence Action Group to South Uptown. Then number five is referring to staff the subject matter of an ordinance amending Title 12, Chapter 240 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to uh, housing, lead poisoning prevention and control, amending provisions related to lead paint disclosure notifications. So before I open up to questions from my colleagues, I actually wanted to take a moment to invite up Erin from the chair of the uh, Community Environmental Advisory Commission to, just to give us a little bit more information about this. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to mention that the original reason why we started looking into the enabling resolution was uh, the request from iMatter to add in youth seats. That made us start reflecting on inclusive, uh, inclusivity and how, as a body, SEAC has not really been reflective of our city as a whole. We tend to lack voices of people of color, um, lacking in age range. Often we don't have many youth voices. And so we wanted to start thinking more about how we can make some structural changes. Uh, we had detailed conversations March, April, May, and June that led up to edits to the enabling resolution. Um, and we have made some significant changes that end up uh, removing some of the categorical dis uh, distinctions between like who can serve and like what sort of role they play on SEAC that, that tend to hamstring staff and applicants, um, staff from the sustainability, sustainability division. Um, and I do think that it's important to note that most SEAC members have been residents, whether they've held advocacy, technical, expert, industry, or agency positions. Um, all the people who are on SEAC right now, even with these changes, could be reappointed. But this opens the door to allow other people to see themselves when they're reading the enabling resolution, see themselves as being somebody who's eligible to be able to serve on SEAC. Um, when we had the vote, uh, there were six yeses, three noes, and the people who voted no were really concerned about the value of technical expertise and how that's being portrayed on um, with the way that the roles have been div divvied up. 13 community experts, six, uh, six technical experts. Personally, I think it's important to have this chance to value community expertise for what that is, community expertise, and have it supported by technical experts. So I really do appreciate that you are um, looking at this and increasing the chance for new voices to be heard. Great. Thank you so much. And on that note, do any of my colleagues have any comments or questions? And I would like to welcome Council Member Johnson. Seeing no comments, did you? Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on item number four, I want to say that I really like the new name. So, congrats to the Neighborhood Association. Seeing no further comments or questions, I move approval of the consent agenda. All of those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and that item is approved. So now we will move into our public hearing. Uh, we will be hearing the um, considerations of amendments to the small and underutilized business enterprise pro, uh, program ordinance. Sean, Director of Contact, Contract Compliance for the Civil Rights Department will be making the staff presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name, uh, members of the committee, my name is Sean Skibby. I'm the Contract Compliance Division Director in the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. I'm here today to present changes to Title 16, Chapter 423 of the Code of Ordinances, establishing the Small and Underutilized Business Program. I'll start today with an overview of the SUBP program and what it does, uh, and then, I'll then address why these amendments are being brought forth today. And then last, I'll go into details on the changes to the ordinance before the committee, just a high-level overview, and of course, have time for questions at the end. So about Chapter 423, uh, the, chapter, the Chapter 423 ordinance establishes the city's small and underutilized business enterprise program and establishes that it applies to city contracts over $100,000. This program is a primary major uh, component of the city's efforts to utilize minority and women-owned businesses. These, uh, the program establishes that each applicable contract must be reviewed by contract compliance for opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses to be used on these contracts. If there is the opportunity to use these firms, there will be contract goals set to uh, that contract and in order to be awarded the contract, a bidder must either meet those goals or show good faith efforts to do so. Uh, if a contractor does not meet the goal or show good faith efforts, the uh, contractor's bid is rejected. And if a contractor's bid is accepted, if a contractor does get past that hurdle, uh, the, the contractor and the contractor is awarded the contract uh, it must continue to demonstrate compliance with SUBP. So, very important program in the city's contract administration process. If I can, real quick, jump in here. Um, can you explain a little bit further what it means to demonstrate good faith efforts? Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. The uh, requirements for demonstrating good faith efforts, that's actually a term of art. So on its face, that has sort of a plain language meaning, meaning that says, I sort of did my best. That's not what we're referring to here. Good faith efforts are actually uh, articulated in the ordinance in 423.90. Uh, and there are essentially seven factors that we look at that a contractor has to demonstrate that it undertook uh, before it can be awarded the contract. So things like reaching out to uh, minority and women-owned businesses, negotiating with them with an, a good faith objective to work with them on that contract, providing them information to, uh, providing them information about the work that is required on the contract and uh, things, other things that are laid out in that section. Thank you, I have a question or comment from Council Member Cano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just curious if you could help contextualize um, more about the $100,000 um, threshold for a contract, because I know there's been discussion inside the city about different levels and why, and so I'm very supportive of the $100,000 level, but would like to just hear the rationale for why we need to kind of stick to that, and just wanted to see if you could share what um, staff have been discussing on that point. Mr. Chair, Council Member Cano, there, ha there has been discussion about that threshold and changing it. So right now, we are sticking with $100,000 in the SGBP program because we're essentially following the threshold for formal bids. Uh, it's also important to note that the $100,000 threshold aligns with the target market program. So SGBP right now does not overlap with target market because the target market threshold is up to $100,000 and the SUBP program is for contracts over that amount. So that's where, that's some of the context I think that's behind that threshold. I know there have been con uh, conversations about raising it uh, or changing that threshold. Uh, those conversations are not yet final, that no changes have been made, and so we're keeping that threshold at 100,000 for now. I have a question from, or comment from Council Member Gordon. So this is a comment. Um, so as, um, as lead author of the ordinance uh, amendment, I felt very strongly that we should keep it at $100,000. $100,000 seems like a significant contract. There's the potential for that to be broken up into other pieces. And I'm worried about us going up so high that we end up missing more work and more money <clears throat> through, through other contracts. Um, I, 
do know that there was some discussion because there is discussion about looking at raising it generally for the city to 175,000, and so that's why the discussion came up as well: should we change this ordinance or not? And I, uh, it's partly my, I think, um, I mean, we had some interactions and discussions about it, but um, I was I really wanted to keep it at 100,000 for now and make sure we have that bigger discussion in a more thoughtful way. And at this point, I probably would oppose raising it even. Thank you for that comment. Do you have more for your presentation? Uh, I do have a few more slides. All right. That's all right. The floor is back to you. Okay, thank you. So next I'm going to talk about why we're amending the ordinance now and bringing forward the changes that we are today. Uh, there are really several reasons why they're before the committee today. First, the ordinance is set to expire on December 1st of this year. So that's just an important thing for the ordinance to continue and for the program to be continuous and not have a lapse. In addition, there are procedures and definitions that are important to update to ensure the ordinance reflects the disparity study findings as well as ensuring the ordinance can be administered effectively on city contracts. And finally, the 2017 disparity studies showed that disparities continue to persist in the city's contracting marketplace. This study provides the legal foundation required to continue to administer this, this program. So when we're talking about that extension, this disparity study provides us with the uh, legal, legally required evidence to continue to do so. So what is being amended? Uh, the first thing these amendments address uh, is a pro extending the ordinance, as I mentioned, December 31st, 2025. Second, uh, updating definitions to align with the disparity study and the city's welcoming city policy, and then also removing unnecessary definitions. Uh, we also provide um, some modifications to the good faith efforts requirements to, to your question, uh, Chairman Cunningham, about what the good faith efforts are the contractors have to follow. We are uh, clarifying what those are. Uh, we are also providing clarity about SUBP requirements after contract award and clarifying, pen, clarifying penalties for noncompliance, including uh, actually adding in a penalty for contractors that substitute or replace uh, SUBP firms uh, without getting division approval. And then we're also requiring these penalties to be incorporated into the actual contract that the city has with the contractor. <coughs> And that's really it for a summary. Again, I'm happy to entertain more questions. Otherwise, thank you to uh, Chairman Cunningham, as well as Councilmember Gordon for his leadership on authoring and shepherding this through the process as well. All right, thank you, Mr. Skibby. Do we have any other co questions or comments from my colleagues? Looks like they were all already answered. Thank you so much for this. And now let me go ahead and we, so seeing no further comments or questions, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing now. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, so I have here that no one signed up to speak to this particular public item uh, pu for this public hearing. Um, for the other item, I recommend the uh, to talk to me afterwards or to submit your comment in, at council comment at minneapolismn.gov um, for the other item. So I do not have anybody signed up, but is there anything else, anyone else who would like to comment on the proposed ordinance amendments? Anyone? Yes, so we, we can talk about that because what right now we're not talking about the public hearing is oops, the public hearing is specifically for this item. So for the other for number two, we can touch base about that afterwards. Oh, this one as well? Okay. No, that's okay. It was a little confusing on how it was written here. Yes, please, so we can hear you in the microphone. If you could, please uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Of course. Sorry for the confusion. My name is Shirley Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R, and I live at 2426 13th Avenue South, Minneapolis, 55404. I have a question about you're saying 100,000 or more in income to be eligible for this program. That's what you mean. Uh, and then requiring um, methods of outreach to guarantee that they're outreaching to 
to encourage disparity. What about small businesses at that level? A lot of the businesses in my area and along Lake Street in particular and Franklin Avenue are ethnic and culturally specific owners. And they have, uh, I don't know if there's a limit that a number of employees you have for this to start, but they generally speaking higher within their own groups. And the, dis the disparity is being solved by having multiple businesses of all these ethnic groups in our area. Now you're requiring them to hire outside of their ethnic groups and show how they are doing that. Have you ever considered that part of the question? I'll sit down because I, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, is there anyone else here who would like to speak to this item? Anyone? All right, not seeing any further uh, folks here to speak. Um, I will go ahead and close this public hearing. We had some questions that maybe Mr. Skibby can answer. Uh, would you be willing to help clarify some of those points? For community members, thanks. Mr. Chair, are you referencing uh, public, tes public testimony? Sure, so thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to clarify. The, just to clarify on the $100,000 threshold, that is a threshold for the contracts uh, that the city enters, the, the, the amount of the contract with the city. And so there is not an income, a minimum income threshold uh, for the SUBP. Actually, there is, uh, there's not really a maximum income threshold, but there are thresholds to ensure that the business is actually small and underutilized, those align with the uh, small Business Administration standards established by federal requirement. Um, the city also follows a 1.3 million personal, uh, 1.3 million dollar personal net worth cap, and so there are caps on the income to ensure that the program operates for small, small businesses. Um, and in regards to hiring and using firms. Um, First, I'll note that this is a contracting program, so it does not require uh, employment. Um, and as far as hiring, we do think it's important that contractors offer, oppor off offer opportunities uh, to uh, minority and women, minorities and women that are interested in, in working on these contracts and the businesses that they own. Uh, we do not mandate that they, it, the, the program is not a mandate. It, it, we require meeting the goals or good faith efforts. And as far as mandates on, or as far as any goals on utilizing minority or women-owned firms, we don't specify that any particular minority group is used when we do have an MBE goal. So um, with that, I'm happy to entertain any more questions that the committee might have, if there are any further that arose from the testimony. Otherwise, I hope that provides some yeah. clarification. Council Vice President, did you have something? We have a question or comment from Council Vice President Jenkins. I do have a comment. Uh, it is not necessarily a, a question for Mr. Skeedy, but um, it's more of, a, uh, I guess, a staff direction for uh, the city attorney to look into, you know, as I was getting briefed on this um, um, ordinance change, um, I kept coming across the term minority in in the process and so um i asked um director corbel and and mr skeevy about how what is the legal use of that term and so i would like the city attorney office to help us determine do we legally need to use that language minority in um, our documentation. City Attorney. Yes, Chair Cunningham and Councilmember Jenkins. Um, I believe that the terms we use do parallel the federal programs that are similar in nature. However, if you wanted to issue a staff direction, we'd certainly look into if there are any other alternatives. Um, I would like to issue that uh, directive to determine if in fact we can use um, more positive language as we and when we're referring to communities of color as opposed to minority which 
in my mind, and I think in the way that it's used, symbolizes a deficit, and we we don't want to continuously perpetuate that language. Great, thank you, Council Vice President. So the motion on currently on the floor is a staff direction. Um, instructing the city attorney's office to more deeply explore the language, the legalities around the language um, with minorities, particularly within this program is what I'm hearing. Particularly in this program, but, but citywide as well. But citywide, yeah. as, as, as we did find out more and more, what are the legal um, requirements for the use of this term, um, I would like to see it changed in all of our language. Great. Is that clear? All right. So that motion on the table, um, I'm, we already have a move. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. That motion is approved. Thank you, Council Vice President. Back to the um, original uh, item here. Do we, oh, Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Cunningham. I'd like to move approval of, of the uh, ordinance and um, really appreciate the work that um, staff put into this. It, this was kind of a formality because we had to extend the ordinance uh, after the um, disparity study was completed. Um, but I think we did it in a, in a good way. I really appreciate um, that we put a little more teeth into it and a little more clarity about good faith eth efforts and some penalties when people are switching up subcontractors and things like that. So I think that'll be significant. Uh, I think we've actually made a lot of good progress. With that, I'll also note my openness to um, changing some of the terminology. I really appreciate uh, Councilmember uh, Jenkins' careful read of it and, and agree that if uh, that's not a term that we have to use, um, that I would certainly entertain even changing the language between now and the council meeting um, to better define it. I think we've, uh, at least speaking for myself, since I've been here, I always heard that terminology and just assumed that it was some federal rule that that's, we, we had to abide by. And if we find out there's an opportunity for us not to, in fact, maybe we can just define our own word early on in the ordinance and then use better word the rest of it if, if, if we're so bound. So there might be some ways to get around that. So hopefully we can find out soon. I actually want to go uh, back and circle back to Council Vice President Jenkins. Is there a, a date that you would like to have this uh, report back? Uh, by our next committee meeting. All right. Can we add that to it? Okay. Thank you. Great. So Council Member Gordon has moved approval of the amendments to the small and underutilized business enterprise program ordinance, updating procedures for administration and amending the sunset date. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and that item is approved. Thank you so much for all of your work on that. So our first discussion item. So we have today three presentations. Um, that I'm very excited about um, as as we have throughout this entire year um, it's important that all of the work that happens that reports to this committee that the committee members know about it and know the folks who are behind it and understand the passion that's happening behind the work we have a lot of amazing city staff who are doing really great work and so I see a lot of new faces and so I'm excited to see you all here and hopefully we'll be able to stay in contact moving forward uh, so our first discussion item is receiving and filing a presentation on the work of the emergency preparedness division of the Minneapolis Health Department we have excuse me if I, Pam Blixit? Blixed. Blix, prepared disk manager health in the health department will be giving today's presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Pam Blix and I've uh, been with the city um, since 2002 um, at the beginning of this particular program. And so I'm happy to share some of our work and kind of orient you to some of the details of the of the work that we do and um, the things that we're responsible for in the city. So preparedness, public health preparedness is really uh, there um, in times of emergencies, but it's also little, um, little incidents throughout the uh, portion of um, anything that could potentially impact residents of the city and their and their potential health and their well-being. So 
um, we can be ready. We are ready to respond to any particular emergency, large and small. Um, the one that's pictured here, of course, is the one of the larger ones that impacted a large portion of residents of the city on the north side. When I first started with the city, I thought um, that, that my job would be really easy because I figured that there was a not much that happened in the city of Minneapolis. We're, we're not on the coasts, we don't have hurricanes, we don't have um, earthquakes, that type of thing, and I found out that I was horribly wrong. Um, things do happen here, and as a matter of course, um, our department has responded to a number of events each year, uh, some of them bigger than others. During the course of my time here, our department has, the, our full department has been deployed three different times. The first time for the 35W bridge collapse, then uh, for the H1N1, where we had to vaccinate thousands of people in, within the city, and then uh, for the north side tornado, where we um, stood up and ran a shelter for the residents for three days, then we ran a um, center to provide services in the Farview Park for a week and well, actually 10 days and then after that we ran circulator buses throughout the city to um, provide access to residents to get them to be able to get to services that they might need. So our current status is that we are fed, totally federally funded. Um, um, well not totally, about 95% federally, federally funded and we have 2.2 FTEs within the city that, in the health department that uh, work on um, public health preparedness. We have established a way for our department to be on call on a 24 seven basis. And we have a team that is trained throughout the department of three deep people that can respond and get stood up to be able to uh, do any of the things that we might need to lead on at any given time. And we have uh, plans that are many, many notebooks thick <laughs> of things that um, help us, guide us um, in our work and our potential response. One of the things that I wanted you to be aware of is that we are um, not just guided uh, federally, but we are guided by state statute, and that uh, the city council is considered our public health board, and under that mandate, we have certain requirements for preparedness, and those requirements um, are listed here, and so I just wanted you to be aware of what what we have to um, do on a regular basis. We are um, maintaining our partnerships, we conduct assessments, we train and exercise, we do surveillance and monitoring, we participate in recovery, and we ensure accurate communication. And all of those mandates are in place and will be in place um, if and when our federal funding um, goes away. So give you a sense of our, our federal funding flow, um, our uh, work really gets mandated through the Centers for Disease in Atlanta, Georgia. And we, um, they, they set up our guidelines and they set up our requirements on an annual basis of the types of work that where we should focus our efforts. Much of the work that we do is really focused on disease prevention and control, but we have many other requirements that we strive to work to achieve to meet. In the end, um, all the requirements that come down to us at the local level are uh, based on 15 capabilities. All of these capabilities are set up in such a way that they're measurable and they are ones that we can um, strive to achieve. They have a goal for us over a five year period where we are working to uh, meet all the gaps and uh, make sure that we have addressed all the concerns within the capabilities. 
So we're currently in year four of the five years, and so we're getting close to uh, getting all of our gaps uh, met. Another area that I wanted you to be aware of that the health department is responsible for within the city, we have a city emergency response plan, and that is run out of the Office of Emergency Preparedness in um, the, yeah, the Office of Emergency Preparedness. And through that plan, we've identified the areas that the health department is responsible for leading on within the city, should any of the incidents so occur that we would, we would be needed. So we're responsible for doing responding to a disease outbreak, foodborne illness, heat and cold, extreme weather, shelter and mass care, reunification and assistance centers. We also are responsible for supporting any other large scale efforts that would be needed. So for example, um, large scale events, we also do environmental health if there was some sort of uh, spill or uh, leak. We also do help with continuity of operations within the city, communication and education, and behavioral health. Today we have a large number of uh, personnel um, within the department who have been trained and um, have participated in a number of exercises with us. We also have available to us mutual aid. Um, we have agreements, formal agreements in place with over 30 other health departments in the metro region that we could call upon to assist us. And, in, and they have in the past come in to provide help for our large scale emergencies. We also have a number of supplies that are available for us to deploy and that are located at a warehouse and then we have the resources of the federal government in something called the Strategic National Stockpile. We have uh, volunteers available to us um, that can be deployed. We have something called the Medical Reserve Corps. We also have communication tools available um, through uh, to coordinate with our hospital partners and our other public health partners. And then we have something called BioWatch, which is a network of sensors that are deployed out there to uh, check for potential contaminants or terrorist type threats such as anthrax. And they are monitored on a daily basis and then verified by the lab. The Strategic National Stockpile is available to us when we add upon the governor's or our mayor's request and it has a large number of supplies of medical materials, pharmaceuticals, um, different uh, things that would, could be potentially used in a hospital setting or a mass care setting that would be available if we needed to use it in any sort of type of attack that we would be undergone, so it's available within 12 hours at our disposal. We have formal partners um, in place with all of our hospitals and um, emergency management, um, our EMS partners throughout the region. We have a coalition that we have signed an agreement with to coordinate um, in the metro area. And then we are part of something called the City's Readiness Initiative, which is a 16 county um, public health association that we plan for and prepare for um, large scale um, outbreaks. And we uh, coordinate um, both in Minnesota and with our friends in Wisconsin <laughs> to plan for and we'll be doing a full scale exercise with all of these partners where we'll be standing up a large scale dispensing site in each of those jurisdictions in 2020. Then we have all of our other friends and partners. Um, we count our partnerships and as valuable resources and they include many community groups, 
many other formal organizations such as the Red Cross, uh, churches, the University of Minnesota. It's just like an endless amount of folks who are there to assist us when we need them. One of the things that we have in place in our department is that we have a major partnership with our friends in Hennepin County. We coordinate with them to, ha we have a formal contract with them to do the disease investigation and control as well as planning for some of our events for preparedness. So they too are part of our formal network that we can count on. Currently, um, as I know you're aware, is that we are involved in the response to the folks um, over at Hiawatha and Franklin. And we um, initiated uh, our department's incident management team response in the middle of August. And we've been active ever since, planning for sanitation, um, healthcare coordination, as well as harm reduction at the site. And we will continue to work with our partners and everybody else to help move this along and bring an orderly transition. One of our big challenges is that our funding, federal funding, has continued to decrease, although in the last few years it's pretty bit, much been stable. And so we are um, anticipating and that we will continue to receive federal funds, but uh, you know, we just never know. And so um, we just have to put that out there, That's, um, that we are heavily dependent on um, the folks at the federal level for support. So, uh, questions? I actually have a question. You, you mentioned uh, briefly how there is a plan and that the health department's plan for an emergency um, fits together. Can you explain a little bit more about how you partner with the Office of Emergency Management for and coordinate uh, across uh, departments? Sure. Uh, so the Office of Emergency Management has a full-scale city plan, and within the plan, uh, they have uh, identified who's responsible for certain areas of the plan. And within that plan, the last time it was done, which was about a year and a half ago, that it got fully rewritten, um, everybody went through and looked at um, who was um, going to be responsible for certain pieces of the plan. So for example, uh, with the shelter aspect of the plan. The technically within the city ordinance, the fire chief is responsible for sheltering. And uh, so we met with the fire chief because the fire department really doesn't have the capacity to provide sheltering at this time, or then they don't plan to. Um, so we met with them to coordinate um, who is going to be responsible for the pieces of that. And we ironed that out and worked with the Red Cross and made sure that we have um, an understanding with, within all of us who's going to do what piece. So we've kind of, for in every aspect, gone through who's going to do what and make, make, making sure that we, everybody has an understanding of what's being covered. Yeah, I just wanted to see how that fits together. I just want to recognize that um, you and your team basically are the barrier between us and a dystopic uh, movie, horror movie. Um, <laughs> I think we can take that for granted. Um, and so just want to throw that out there um, that, you know, while... 
a lot of partners in, involved, right? Yes, but <laughs> the fact that you are there helping to coordinate and organize that, so accept the raise and praise for the work oh. because you because you do a lot of good work. So thank you so much. Do yep. any of, oh, I have a question or comment from Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just appreciate the presentation and all the work and thought that goes into all of this planning. Obviously, it's work that we hope we never, ever have to use uh, or need, but as you've shown, there's been a lot of instances where it's uh, really helped make a difference in people's lives and can be the difference between somebody living or dying in a lot of cases. So uh, it's just greatly appreciated all of that Thank effort. You. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for your time and your work and your presentation. Um, Seeing no further questions, I move to receive and file this item. All those in, favors, uh, in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and that item is received and filed. So now we're moving on to our second discussion item, which is receiving and filing a presentation on the Environmental Health Division of the Minneapolis Health Department. We're having a health department uh, party here today. The, we have Dan Hoff, Director of Environmental Health, who will be giving today's presentation. Mr. Huff, the floor is yours when you're ready. We have uh, some show and tell. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and Council Members. My name is Daniel Huff, and I'm the Director of Environmental Health, and I am joined today with a number of your health inspectors. Um, so if everybody in the Environmental Health Group could just raise your hand. So all these folks right here are the folks that make sure all the restaurants that you eat at and the swimming pools and all your hotels are safe. Um, so I hope you'll go out and enjoy dinner tonight and think of these folks. All right. Okay. Um, Minneapolis had the very first health inspection program in the state of Minnesota. Um, one of the, the cool things about uh, our, our lineage or our history is we used to actually go out into the suburbs, or rather then it was the farms, even into Wisconsin, to inspect dairy herds, because USDA didn't do that then. We did it. We would actually go, and any milk sold in Minneapolis, we inspected the herd where it came from. Um, and uh, I love this picture here. Um, I showed this to Patrick Hanlon, and then he cited us for dumping in the storm sewer. But I, uh, I think the statute of limitations had expired, so we were safe. Um, just a quick, uh, how, how I'm going to uh, present today. First, I just want to talk about our authority and then uh, what we do, how we do it, and then what we do to ensure quality here. Uh, so first of all, this is an old health department badge as we celebrate our 150 years. Uh, I think this is kind of a cool uh, old uh, badge there. But uh, basically, we operate today under a state authority, although when we started our program um, over 100 years ago, it was under Minneapolis's authority. But since then, the state has uh, become involved, and really the State Department of Health and the State Department of Agriculture are in charge of enforcing the state's health codes. But they delegate that authority to us. Um, and so we actually act as the, the Commissioner of Health or the Commissioner of Agriculture's designee for Minneapolis. Um, now what that means is we have to fulfill our contract with them. We have to do a number of things in order to maintain that delegation and to have that authority. And we are subject to a state audit, uh, which happens regularly. So. Um, most of our program is state delegated, so you can see all the different type of food things that we inspect, but also we inspect swimming pools and our hotel or lodging facilities. Um, we do our, our foodborne and waterborne investigation and then plan review uh, for health code, all under that delegation. Uh, so um, uh, this is pretty significant for us. We're the only city inspection program that is actually audited by the state for how we do our job. There may be state rules, like our building official follows the state building code, but 
the Department of Industry and Labor does not actually audit the inspectors. Department of Health and Department of Ag will actually come in and audit these folks right here and our program to make sure that we're conforming to how uh, the delegation agreement is written. And the reason that is significant is that in Minneapolis in 2010, we actually failed that audit. Um, and we're at loss of, excuse me, losing the program, um, which actually did happen in St. Paul. Uh, so it is a real issue that we are very diligent about uh, making sure that does not happen. Um, but we also have a number of city things that we do. City uh, programs such as Green to Go or our Styrofoam Ban, uh, Staple Foods, Tattoo Parlors, Laundry Tanning, uh, Food Defense. I'll talk more about that later. And then we support a number of other departments. So, for example, civil rights, they don't have inspectors that go to every restaurant in the city every year, and we do. So we check, make sure the sick and safe time poster is posted. If we have issues and we think people are not granting sick time, we um, relay that to civil rights so that we can begin or we can be part of their eyes and ears. Uh, it's, a, it's a joint mission because we don't want people working who are sick because they'll get other people sick. Uh, hood cleaning, um, in order to prevent fires in restaurants, uh, fire inspection services and regulatory services runs a, a cleaning program. We make sure that they actually have been cleaned. We're the on-site uh, inspection. We do plan review for any new massage parlors that come in for a city license. Also, if there's issues with the vermin infestation, we'll often go in and, and deal with that. Um, and then incident response, a lot of the things that Pam just talked about uh, our staff are involved in. Uh, and then we also are working on human trafficking and what can we do as inspectors since we're out in the hotels to spot and uh, notify uh, police about human trafficking. If I may interject here, we have a question or comment from Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you mind going back a slide, that would be great. <clears throat> So I want to note, you do a lot of work, a lot of really great work across the city. Last Peace Committee, we heard about the Staple Foods Ordinance and got an update. One of the issues there is it's been around for at least a couple of years since our last update. Compliance is only about 10%, which is really abysmal. And during that conversation, it was uh, brought up that the issue with that is staffing. And so I'm wondering, A, how are staffing levels affecting these other areas of what you do, and what would be really the optimal staffing level compared to where you're at today? And I think this is just a good time to cover this and highlight this for my colleagues as we're looking at the budget and thinking about staffing levels. Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Johnson, yes, that is something that we are uh, always cognizant of. And our first uh, job is to perform our delegation agreement requirements. They um, tend to increase over time, which takes us more, more time and more work. Um, if we don't maintain those, then we lose our ability to inspect. So that's our primary goal. And then secondary is to uh, enforce city ordinances that we are charged with, such as Staple Foods, Green to Go. Um, and then uh, the third priority is then supporting our other departments, sister departments in city initiatives. Um, we, uh, um, in, the, in the 2019 recommended budget, we will have two fewer FTEs than we do currently right now as far as inspectors. Uh, and um, so we're, we're looking at a number of things. One of the things that uh, we will uh, have to scale back on is really stop all of the city program and initiatives um, that we currently work on uh, and enforce uh, just because of capacity issues. Um, so we'll have to back up of all of these things and just focus on the delegation agreement. Um, there's a couple other things that we'll be pulling back from as well. So we won't be able to enforce any of this if uh, under Mr. the proposed budget? Mr. Chair, Council Member Johnson, that is correct. Wow. And uh, I know in the past, too, there were concerns around whether or not we were able to meet FDA minimum safe inspection levels from a staffing standpoint. Are we currently meeting those levels, or are we falling short? Uh, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Johnson, uh, the FDA has a model nationwide for uh, enforcing the food code. 
uh, and they recommend that you have one inspector conduct no more than 250 to 320 inspections per year. Um, the way our work um, um, budgets out for time that inspectors are inspecting our restaurants and such, they're doing about 400 to 500 inspections a year, so much higher than the FDA standard. Now, fortunately, we have above average inspectors. We have some incredible people working here who are very dedicated and we work very efficiently. However, we are stretched and are nowhere close meeting those um, recommended national standards for number of inspectors. Wow. So uh, what is the rationale, not to get too in the weeds here on the budget, because I know we have our budget presentations as well, but what's the rationale for cutting to FTE, do you know? Um, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Johnson, um, that's not within my purview. I guess that's that's the mayor and, and you as, as far as how uh, the budget is determined. Wow. Well, I appreciate uh, you being able to share that. It's obviously extremely concerning, I think, and something that we should all be taking into our uh, budget discussions and considerations because these are uh, essential services for the safety of residents in Minneapolis, and if we shortchange them, we're basically gambling with the safety of both our residents and our visitors in this city. So thank you for uh, all the work you do and to the rest of the team. Thank you. Just to be clear, just to get some clarification, for the two positions that won't be there next year, it was because in in this year's budget, it was one-time dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Mr. Chair, that is correct. That's correct. Okay, so that then we just don't have ongoing dollars for that. And also, just for clarification, for maybe uh, folks who don't know what jurisdiction does what, when you talk about pools, does that include the Minneapolis uh, parks, the pools there? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Yeah. So any of the, um, because the program is delegated to the city of Minneapolis, uh, we inspect any food at Minneapolis Parks or any uh, swimming pools at Minneapolis Parks. So all of the waiting pools, you know that it's uh, um, the pools are open when you see all these people gathering up their blue pool kits and we hit them all in about a week. Uh, there's like 100 swimming pools in the parks, is that right, Ryan? 70, 70, 70. Yeah. 70 waiting pools plus some other pools out of the whole city. So. Great, thank you. I just want to make sure that folks have the clarification on that. Great, thank you. All right, um, and I'll be able to show even more of that. So what we do, um, we inspect uh, 3,600 food establishments. Now this is our number as of a month ago. These tend to change because Minneapolis keeps growing. Every time we add a new apartment building, we add a couple of coffee shops and a restaurant or so. Um, but you can see it's uh, quite a wide variety, uh, including uh, one of our best high schools in the city. Um, that's where my son goes, so I had to go, go Teddy's. Um, here's our swimming pools, um, including the, um, uh, that hot tub that juts out over Lake Street, so we inspect that too. So anything that's in a, uh, an apartment building or a condo building or at the Y or at the park, we inspect it. We even inspect the, the um, um, with our baseball team, the Twins uh, hot tub um, to make sure that, you know, Nobody runs around the hot tub. <laughs> uh, we also do all of our lodging facilities, so this is hotels, but it's also our fraternity and sorority houses. It's a number of different board and lodging facilities, such as group homes, um, and then uh, some of our shelters, such as Harbor Light uh, and other, uh, other places as well. Um, and then we inspect our special events, and this is what takes an amazing amount of uh, coordination and work on our part. We, it is, it's, it's fantastic to live in Minneapolis because we have so many amazing festivals with great food. Uh, and uh, these folks um, are working uh, all the time. Um, and which of you worked this last weekend? Anybody sitting here worked this last weekend? Are those folks, they're taking the day off maybe? Um, Take care of yourself. Yeah. So we, uh, in the last year, in fact, with our current staffing level, we did over 1,500 hours of overtime. Uh, so we assign people, but then invariably we get last-minute requests and uh, uh, just to make sure we can cover. Now, what we're doing right now, we have a triage mechanism. We're actually only inspecting about half 
of the vendors out there at our at our food events. We have over 500 festivals or events in the city a year, and then over 1,300 um, vendors. So we're getting about half of them. One of the things we would probably go back to just 10% of those um, inspecting, just because we can't won't be able to afford that sort of uh, a staff capacity. Um, so, kind of give you an idea of our routine inspections. I like to compare it to an annual physical. So we go out there, and it's really a top-to-bottom inspection of a restaurant. We we interview people, we talk to them. Um, you know, we look at how do you, what do you do if somebody is sick? What what do you exclude them for? How are your temperatures? And so here's some of the tools of our trade here. Okay, so we've got here a couple different kind of thermometers. So we have, um, this is our infrared thermometer, which FDA said be sure you don't use the infrared when you're doing the Super Bowl. So no one mistakes it as a laser sight. Um, we, uh, temperature controls one of our really big things. Here's a pH meter. Um, if you have, um, you know, chem fresh or anything, a fermented product or an acidified product, um, pickled product, we check the pH to make sure that's actually killing the bugs. Um, we, uh, we check our, um, uh, sanitizer equipment, make sure everything's working correctly. It's all about making sure that the conditions will prevent the growth of any bacteria or viruses. Uh, let's see here. Why is nothing happening? Um, now, what's interesting here, there are 890 different standard orders within our land management system, and the health inspectors have to choose the correct one for that correct situation. And uh, in the last year, uh, these folks conducted 4,600 routine inspections, so that's that full annual physical. And then of those, we did 1,200 reinspections. So those are people who didn't pass the first time. We go back and we reinspect, and then they get things fixed. Some people we actually have to go back a third time, and then we sort of ramp up our involvement with them. Um, and we also did uh, 1,800 other inspections. So there's are complaints, or fire calls, or plan review inspections, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, we issued 25,000 orders. So that means these folks called 25,000 different things in our restaurants. They're very thorough and is very precise. Um, we do plan review. We have a great uh, plan review team. Um, anybody that has a new restaurant or remodeling a restaurant has to go through plan review. And then we also check and sign off on anybody that's changing ownership. Um, we do outbreak investigation. And the goal of outbreak investigation, that's when all of the things that we do didn't work and we have the out-of-body experience that nobody enjoys um, pictured here. Uh, we, these are the ones that we've had in this last year. Some of them were pretty serious. Oh, and I forgot cyclospora. How could I forget cyclospora? It was the most exciting one we had. Um, we had a couple that were part of national outbreaks, both the E. coli 0157, that's a very dangerous one. We did have a couple people hospitalized over that. Although we had some deaths in Minnesota, fortunately no one in Minneapolis died of that, and that was the tie to the Romaine outbreak, nationwide outbreak. Uh, we do national events. Um, uh, we presented earlier about our, our work on the Super Bowl, so that was uh, quite, a, quite a fun and involved effort. Um, but we also do food defense. Now, food defense is a new area for us. And this is food safety is what these things are used for. Food defense is protecting the food supply from intentional tampering. Maybe corporate sabotage, maybe just angry employee, maybe bioterrorism. And to do this, we've worked with a lot of different partners. And the Super Bowl was where we really rolled out a robust food defense program and are continuing to work on this. Um, and uh, just want to thank our partners both at uh, MDH, also FDA, I forgot to put FDA on there, but FBI and the uh, Minneapolis police as we develop um, better protections for our food supply. So how we do it? Um, well, we have three guiding principles, and these are really important for us. Whenever we have a question, whenever we come up with a problem, we think, okay, what are our three guiding principles? First, is protect health and safety. Second, though, we always support our businesses and we support our community. 
And then third, we're part of a city that works. That is, we fulfill our delegation agreement. We're effective stewards of uh, city dollars. Um, everything we do is done well. Um, so the base of our program is to fulfill our delegation agreements. Um, of these, with MDA, the city brings in about half a million dollars of revenue for those MDA or agriculture facilities. For MDH facilities, we bring in about four and a half million dollars of revenue. So these two delegation agreements are worth five million dollars to the city in revenue, but in addition to that, it allows us to actually be the inspectors, not a state inspector. So if you're going through and your building inspector says this thing, as opposed to having them go to the state and ask what their inspector says for health, they just talk on the, they're on two floors away from each other, so they just talk and work it out. So the customer never has to feel like they're getting pulled in different directions. Um, one of the value adds, and it's a huge value add that we bring in Minneapolis, and we are known nationwide for our program of education, technical assistance, and outreach to our communities. Um, difference in Minneapolis, about uh, 70 to 80 percent of our restaurants are locally owned. In the suburbs, 70 to 80 percent are corporate. It's really easy to inspect, no offense to Bloomington, they do a great job, great inspectors, but when you go to TGI Fridays and then you go to Ruby Tuesdays, not a lot of different. When you go down Lake Street, there is no TGI Fridays, there's no corporate run places, they're all local homegrown restaurants that are all very different from each other. A lot more interesting, but a lot more challenging as well. So uh, we provide free online training. If you work at a licensed establishment in Minneapolis, we give you a voucher to take these free online training, and you get a certificate for each one you complete. Um, we have created the only Somali language certified food manager course in the US. Um, far here, here, Dr. Farrar is pictured on the left. Um, she is a former health inspector, now has her PhD, and uh, she runs this program for us. Uh, I might add, this pretty nifty thing right here is uh, an award we received from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, a national award. We were one of ten awardees uh, based upon this program and our work with the Somali community. We're very proud of that. Uh, we also have in-house food worker training. When someone is really having a hard time and they're getting a lot of violations, we send them a letter and say, hey, you got a lot of evaluations. Seems like you might need some help. We'll help you for free. We actually hire a consultant, not us, so they're not afraid of the health inspector because they look pretty scary sometimes. Um, we'll go in and provide hands-on training for their entire staff in their kitchen using the inspector report as those are the things they need to work on. Really an amazing program we offer. Um, we've got this uh, food safety photo guide we've developed. We've got videos that are in six different languages, some of them featuring our own staff. Uh, we've developed these new posters, and we have them now as magnets on your basic food safety. And we've worked with a, a private consultant who is helping us get from our technical language to an easier to read format. So they're creating these for us. Uh, we got checklists, uh, and we do business forms. Our, uh, we partnered with uh, the mayor's office and council member Warsami to host a forum for the entire city. Uh, all the city departments for our Somali business owners had over 200 attendees, non-city staff attendees at that. Uh, we're very proud of these. These are labor intensive though, and as you can imagine, we'll be pulling back on these next year um, as we have to really focus on, on uh, our, our delegation agreement. Um, we also, um, a few years ago, we had some uh, extra um, unspent money. So instead of just you know trying to spend it on whatever, we actually uh, worked with council to get that over to CPED where they established a, uh, a health and safety loan that they operate now, uh, Smoke in the Pit, which is um, uh, right near near my house and an excellant barbecue joint, as uh, Councilmember Jenkins knows because it's in uh, um, her ward. Um, uh, also, it took advantage of that to make sure that their smoker was uh, in compliance with uh, a state food code. Great barbecue. Um, 
And then we just are always doing new projects. Uh, we've got some folks who said, you know what? There's a lot of things you have to know when you're a new business owner for a food business. We want to be able to provide a welcome packet. So we developed a welcome packet, and on the very first inspection, their area inspector sits down with them and shows them, here are all the things that we provide for you, and here's how you can use them. If you use these tools we've created for you, it's going to go a lot easier for you. It's also about developing that personal relationship. Each inspector is assigned a district. Um, so, for example, Chair Cunningham, Logan here, um, inspects your district uh, or your ward. And it's about making that uh, relationship so that if a business has a question, they can just call up their inspector and say, hey, what do I do about this? Because we're always there to help. Um, now, how we ensure quality is with Kathy, right here. Um, we actually do, do a lot of things. Uh, one is we have very highly trained staff. In order to be a health inspector, you have to have a college degree with at least 30 hours of science, approved science. And most folks are a science major of some description. You have to be a registered environmental health specialist within two years. That's a national test. It's, uh, I took organic chemistry in college, and this makes organic seem like easy, easy cake. Uh, the registered environmental health specialist test is incredibly difficult. Uh, we have to do emergency preparedness training because we do participate in a number of exercises with our health department. Um, and we have a lot of languages here. A lot of languages are represented, um, uh, language proficiency, and that's important so that we can better serve our constituents. Um, three of our folks have master's degree and we even have a, uh, a doctor. We have a veterinarian on our staff. Um, all right, so we have uh, standard operating procedures. Because we are inspected by the state or audited by the state, we have to very, be very precise in how we do our business. So we have, how thick is this, Kathy? 100 pages or so? Oh, at least. Yeah. So one of the things that Kathy does is she trains everyone to follow our field guide. Uh, we also have created marking instructions. So there's, what, 850 different standard orders? Got to make sure you call the right one under the right situation. So Kathy and Bob, her colleague, uh, the other senior health inspector, have developed these market instructions. So in every case, this is if you have a question, you go there, it tells you what order to call it. This builds consistency so that you don't have one inspector calling it one way and another inspector calling it a different way. Uh, the other thing that Bob and Kathy are is they are actually standardized food safety inspection officers the SFSICs of our group. I just made that acronym up. Um, they're actually, uh, the way standardization works is an FDA person standardizes a state standard who then standardizes Kathy and Bob. They go out into the field and they do eight parallel inspections and Kathy and Bob have to call everything the exact same way as that state standard does. I think you're allowed to miss just a few, right? Um, and uh, uh, Bob even, um, actually Bob and Kathy together figured out that uh, Bob had gotten called one wrong. They followed it up and they were right. The standard was wrong. So I always love it when we show up this state. Um, very, very precise though. Uh, and then they standardize all of our staff. And uh, let's see, right now Bill and Dane are already standardized. Nick is standardized, Jana is undergoing standardization as well as Husto, and we're working through this so everyone gets standardized. Uh, and if you don't have that pass, you got to do it again until you get it. <clears throat> uh, they also conduct technical meetings uh, every month. All will have a, uh, an hour meeting on how you call part of the plumbing code to make sure everyone's doing it just right. Um, and then we also do peer inspections. This is what I love because I get to go out in the field with an inspector, but each of them get t uh, teamed together. So it builds camaraderie and also, hey, how do you see this? How do you look at this? Making sure we're building consistency. We've even started doing it with Hennepin County. It's a state food code. We should be calling it the same as other jurisdictions. Uh, and then um, we have uh, a number of additional projects that we've been working on. Um, with uh, Councilmember Gordon, 
health and safety issues around uh, entertainers and our sexually oriented businesses has been a, a, an ongoing project. Dane has been one of the primary workers on that, providing our protocol. And as Pam mentioned, we're um, working with five of our team who have been very involved in coordinating issues at the Hiawatha encampment. And I, no story would be complete of our food lodging pools without our most famous um, businessman here, which is Jaquan Faulkner. Um, this is a, a buddy of mine and I uh, joined him for lunch when he was up at the fire station. He, he Jaquan gave me um, a little junior firefighter badge that I, I put on my, my phone so that I could uh, always remember him. While this was a great story, this is not a one-off. This is a representation of those guiding principles I talked about. Everything Jaquan did, he had his permit, his permit was paid for, right? We don't waive permit fees. You set the permit fees, we just enact them. Now we help pay for it, for his first permit. He had to meet all the rules, all the regulations. He had to have his hand washing station, his thermometer. We helped him get that, but he had it. And we trained him. He met the rules for health and safety. We did whatever we could to support him and his business. We hooked him up to Neon, uh, which is one of our great partners, um, uh, one of the CPEDS BTAP pro, uh, providers. Um, and uh, it's, it's great how this story has taken off. But the main story is this is what we do every day. And it just so happens that this one, the press picked up and ran with it, uh, really ran with it. I, I was amazed. I had calls from South Africa thanking us for our work on this. Um, uh, but this is what we do every day. So, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, team, for all that you do. That was a lot. Those are pretty big numbers. So thank you very much for all of your work. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? No one? It was very thorough. So thank you so much. Um, seeing no questions or comments. Wait, can you actually tell us what those two certificates oh, yes. are right there? Thank you, because I forgot to mention them. So um, in 2010, uh, the program was audited by the state and we failed. Well, last year we got this award from the state, from MDH. A uh, certificate of recognition for our entire program and all the work we do is specifically focusing on the work that we have done on uh, outreach to our um, uh, entrepreneurs, especially our, our new arrival, new American entrepreneurs. And then this one, we just got a couple weeks ago, and this was uh, another award for our work on the Super Bowl and all the collaborative work of all of our, our partners. So um, kind of went from zero to hero. <laughs> um, and uh, I might add, too, uh, this is something I'm also quite proud of. If we look at the city uh, survey, the 2006 employee engagement survey, this group right here had the highest employee engagement of any operating department in the city. They were at 92.8% um, uh, employee engagement. So. They love their work, they're incredibly hardworking, and uh, the things they do to keep all of us safe, I sure do appreciate it. So thank you, guys. And just to clarify, you meant 2016, right? You said yes. 2006. Okay, great. Sorry, 2016. No, and I just was like, I think you may have meant sooner than that. I great. did, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. Um, and on that, uh, I see no further or you know, questions or comments. I move to receive and file this item. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and that item is received and filed. Filed. Our final discussion item is receiving and filing a presentation on the Urban Scholars Program. I have a special place in my heart for the Urban Scholars Program. Um, having been someone who has worked with Urban Scholars and has worked closely with the program in my previous work at City Hall. So Cassie Garnier is here from the Civil Rights Equity Division and she will be giving the presentation. The floor is yours. 
Good afternoon, uh, Chair Cunningham, Vice, uh, Vice President Jenkins, and committee members. Thanks for having us today. My name is Cassidy Gardner, and I oversee the Civil Rights Equity Division. Um, and I'm he also the director of the Urban Scholars Program. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about our program and about the amazing results that we're seeing. Um, sometimes these programs, it's just about feel good, which we'll get to those stories. Um, but we've undertaken an evaluation and a, a longer term strategic planning process and getting back some of the results that I think you all will be excited to hear about. Um, I would like to start by introducing our team. Um, oh, they all moved. Um, I, um, here I have Maria Lee. She is the city of Minneapolis site coordinator. So she is the one who's responsible for all the scholars who are he placed here. She manages those folks plus their supervisors. We have uh, Brittany Rice who is the Urban Scholars Program Manager, and she manages all of our partnerships with our organizations that also host scholars, as well as managing our leadership and professional development training, which I'll get into in a minute. We also have Jasmine Logan, um, who is temporarily in our office, but she's supporting our work as a program assistant for the next couple of months. And then I am also joined by a number of city employees who have gone through our program. Um, we have Jamil, we have Haley, we have Abdullahi, um, we have Guled here, Jean Kelly, Ratana, and Nick. Um, and so these are the faces of the folks who have gone through the Urban Scholars Program and are just employed here at the city. Um, we have IT represented, the mayor's office, we have CPED in a couple of different divisions, we have civil rights, of course, and uh, NCR. Um, and I would like to just note that we had our first hire in the council offices, Vice President um, Jenkins hired Zoe, and she was here, but I saw her, had uh, she had to escape. So we're well represented. She's, she's um, working on a project right now, but I invited her to come back. So okay. hopefully she'll be able to make it before your presentation is over. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to show you where we're going to go in this conversation, just an overview, I'm going to do a little bit of background. I know that you all are probably already familiar with the program, but I have some answers to some of the questions I most often hear from um, our elected officials and our departments. Um, so to begin, Urban Scholars is a uh, the city's leadership and professional development internship program that provides students from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds a distinctive professional experience focused on gaining essential leadership skills and creating resume building uh, career pathways. Urban Scholars is currently administered from within the Civil Rights Equity Division at the City of Minneapolis, but it's grown into a multi-organizational collaborative with various partners serving as host organizations. Our mission is to provide students from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds the distinctive professional experience that I had just mentioned. Some background on where that comes from. Um, I know that none of you are strangers to the 2010 Economic Policy Institute's report on even pain, um, but that uh, report showed that Minneapolis is leading the nation with the worst unemployment disparities. What some folks don't know is that um, Austin Algernon came back um, actually through Wells Fargo and did a deeper dive into why does Minneapolis have the, the disparities that they see? What are some of the root causes? And the four things that he named were the achievement gap in educational outcomes, both in um, high school and in uh, post-secondary education, hiring bias, the lack of professional networks for young people of color, particularly in comparison to their white counterparts, and then the relative young age of the workforce of color. And so that kind of feeds into the um, silver tsunami, if you will, that slew of white retirements, compounded by the, the educational achievement gaps that we see, and then the relative age of the workforce, there is a, there's a, a talent gap. Um, students aren't able to have as much experience as they need to be gained these jobs. Um, in response, the City of Minneapolis, along with the Advocates for Human Rights, the University of Minnesota Human Rights Center, um, and uh, a couple other partners held a conference in December of 2011 um, called One Minneapolis, A Call to Action, to discuss the racial disparities. And one of the things that bubbled to the top um, was the need to undertake the racial equity work here at the city. And so in 2012, the council passed resolution 2012R456, supporting equity and employment in Minneapolis and the region. 
and wanted to lead by example. So how could we set an example related to um, hiring, retaining, and promoting more people of color and continue to collaborate intentionally with this work? Um, so was born Urban Scholars. In 2012, the city welcomed its first inaugural cohort, um, selecting and placing eight scholars. So 2010, that was almost a decade ago. Where are we now? The city still doesn't reflect the community that we serve. Um, this is pulled from our HR dashboard. We have 72% of our employees are white, 28% are people of color. Um, urban Scholars, um, is able to operate outside of our normal hiring practices. And so we've been able to develop some really unique tools related to recruitment, related to addressing hiring bias, our selection process. And what that's resulted in is that our program participants are 88% uh, people of color um, and 12% white students. So um, Urban Scholars has three goals and my staff will tell you that everything we do are tied to this. You can question them at any given point, um, but our goals are up there. I won't read them, um, but each of these goals ties back directly to the root causes that were outlined in the uneven pain report. Our evaluation that I had just spoken of has also gone back to confirm that those are still the same reasons um, and while it's been a decade, we still haven't seen much movement. So this is where oftentimes I hear, okay, but why is Urban Scholars different? What makes Urban Scholars different? How is it anything other than just an internship uh, program? Our hiring practices, the way we recruit and engage with students, and our programming sets us apart. So everything our team does ties back to those root causes of the employment disparities, and we have uniquely woven through a racial and social justice lens in each of those, uh, in each of those touch points. So let's get into the nuts and bolts. I don't want to bore you too much, but in case you don't know, the Urban Scholars inter Internship Structure, we run from the end of May until August. Um, students spend 32 hours a week in meaningful work placements in their departments, and then eight hours a week, they participate in the Leadership Institute, commonly known as USLI. So our first goal, like I said, was to provide leadership and professional development training. We see this being done through our Leadership Institute. Students get together in a cohort model of learning where they undertake professional development training that has been designed and is now owned by Urban Scholars um, from the Institute for Professional Development, um, utilizing best practices, what our supervisors say they need, and for what um, our employers across the metro say that they need. They also receive um, leadership development. Uh, we partnered early on with Wilder and Shannon Institute, um, which is a mid-career leadership development program, which really focuses on um, values-based leadership and how to apply those in uh, a workplace setting. And then we use Toastmasters for public speaking. Um, the one thing that isn't captured here and can't be captured in a binder or a tutorial or a teaching guide is what we provide in this space is oftentimes where students can come together, young, young professionals can come together to talk about what it's like to be in their placements. Whether it's intergenerational differences between leadership and themselves, whether it's um, facing microaggressions in the workplace, we provide a safe space for students to really unpack what it means to be your authentic self in public sector what it means to be working within the institutions that so many of these students are hoping to change. Um, and we spend a lot of time unpacking all of that. There isn't a curriculum for that, but my amazing staff, as well as the consultants that we bring in, um, have, have done a remarkable job in helping support um, students. Our second goal is meaningful work. Uh, Urban Scholars has set out to reclaim the term intern. You shouldn't need professional experience to get an internship. And that's one of the things that we find here in the city is that oftentimes departments are able to just simply select someone, whether it's someone they know, they can put up a, um, an advertisement, they can fill these temp positions without having to move beyond the boundaries of the groups that they know or continuously involved with. Um, and then, there's no one really monitoring that work. And so we work really closely with our departments and with our supervisors. We work across all agencies to help create and craft meaningful work. So these students um, and young people aren't just getting coffee. They're not just doing data entry. They're creating products that are being used across the city. This includes voter engagement plans, community engagement work. This, um, this includes just a plethora of, of um, opportunities. 
and pieces that have left a lasting, lasting mark on the city. Finally, our third goal is related to building those networks. When the program started, we were really focused on making sure that department heads and students got the opportunity to sit down and meet. But what we found was is that if you have a sophomore in college, they do their internship, they don't come back for two years, they apply for a job, that relationship, while um, department heads are extremely gracious and will say, yeah, you can put me down as a reference, most of the time folks want to hear what work ethic they have, what was their work product like, and department heads are just too far removed time-wise and in overseeing their work. And so we've, um, that is still an essential part of our program, but the meaningful network has really come from our cohort model of learning. What we found in year seven is that a number of our former scholars are now in hiring manager positions. And so they're able to look down on resumes and see Urban Scholar and know that that brand means something. It's part of a larger network, a larger community, um, and the cohort has allowed to build lasting relationships. And I think that all of these folks would agree with that. Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one with department leadership, we do networking training, and we do mentoring. So Urban Scholars by the Numbers, here's the fun stuff. So the city of Minneapolis started in 2012 with eight placements, um, and in 2018 we had 46 placements. Um, that is one per department plus council. Um, I'm sure that you were all in very crowded quarters because we had 11 scholars up in council offices this past year. Um, my budget currently funds approximately 23 scholars, um, but we've been able to increase that number in two ways. One, departments have continued to commit to this program. Our brand means something around City Hall and departments are willing to put dollars towards that. Um, and so when CPED decides that they want three scholars, um, David Frank is kind enough to say that he'll pay for two of them. And so that kind of relationship uh, building is, is essential to being able to grow our numbers here in the city. Um, the second reason we're able to expand our number is because of our partners. So the number of scholars, um, the growth of the program has really been in those other placements that we had. So we had 46 here in the city, but we had 72 placements at our partner organizations. That's the state, Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, they were all listed in that opening slide. But what we've been able to do is we've been able to take our fixed costs, such as recruitment, our selection process, um, materials, and we're basically able to, by having these partner come, partners come on board, have been able to divide those fixed costs, and the cost savings for us have then been able to fund additional partners. So when we talk about Urban Scholars, there's the city's program, which we have the 46 amazing folks who were here. The 72 other folks, we administer Urban Scholars, that umbrella organization, but every other organization is responsible for paying their students' wages and their training costs, and then they pay for an administrative cost which helps offset my staffing costs. So, some of our results. In 2018, 15% of our urban scholars continued working at their placements after the summer ended. The federal number is about 7%, so just right there. 2018, these are students, some of them have graduated, some of them haven't. We just conducted a huge evaluation, um, including a long, longevity study, in which we found that 60% of our scholar alumni are currently employed in the public sector, with 41% of them having had a position at one of our partner organizations. Um, that's unheard of in public sector internships. Retention is extremely hard, and so that is a, is a number we're extremely proud of. Over 95% of our alumni credit urban scholars with helping them to get where they are today. Um, we have 96% um, who say that they were more satisfied about their career path after completing Urban Scholars and that they've used what they've learned. 96% of our supervisors said that they would hire their um, scholar if that was possible. So numbers only tell part of the story. The experiences many of our scholars have while participating in the program are beyond what these numbers show. Um, and so I would like to invite Jasmine Logan up here to tell you a little bit more about her experience. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham, Vice President Jenkins, and the rest of the committee members. Uh, so my name is Jasmine Logan. I work within the Equity Division of the Civil Rights Department. Uh, the work I do is directly focused on the Urban Scholars Program, 
I do content review and assessment to help inform curriculum changes um, and enhancements for the next cohort. So, however, uh, my passion for the program goes well beyond my work task. I participated in the program for four summers. I spent all of my time um, during those summers with the city, where I also worked as a part-time employee while I finished up my degree at the U of M. When I began working for the city following my freshman year of college, I had no understanding of what it meant to work for local government, but I knew that this program was providing me with an opportunity that I didn't think I would be able to have um, otherwise. Since I started as a scholar in 2015, I've been able to work within two city departments where I was able to do everything from data analysis and summer reporting um, to actually leading the design and development of a departmental career pathways program, um, which was geared towards enhancing the promotion and retention of people of color and women within that department. I've also been able to serve as a leadership and professional development facilitator for the Urban Scholars Program. Um, which is a role that has greatly shaped my current professional goals. This program has not only afforded me with the opportunity to enhance my professional skills, but it's also instilled within me a greater sense of confidence to bring my own values and passion into my work, and it also empowered me to find my own sense of leadership. When I first began as an urban scholar in 2015, I remember telling a lot of my friends that I would love to work someday for a program just like this, so now that I'm here doing that, I can attest to the amount of work and dedication that the Civil Rights Equity Division puts into this program to make it one that is equitable, innovative, and well-rounded for every scholar that participates. Over the years, I've made countless friends in this program, many of whom are here today, and I can say with confidence that every single one of us would tell you that because of the support and dedication of the staff, this program is one that has enhanced many lives and provided countless opportunities that, may, that we may not have otherwise had. It was an honor for me to participate in the Urban Scholars Program for four summers, and it is an even bigger honor now to work for the same program that has changed my life and the lives of so many others. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Logan. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a preview of what um, we have in store for 2019, um, we're not gonna close the employment disparities with 72 interns or 118 interns. Um, but what we do know is that that is a uh, an opportunity to each year um, not only work with a scholar, but work within organizations. So that's 118 supervisors, that's 118 uh, work teams, um, and we have uh, had the opportunity to go in and do training across uh, or organizations and the agencies that host these scholars. And so that's where the systemic change is coming in. Um, we believe that it's going to do a, a disservice to these students who we so, um, so invest in. Uh, if they get into these organizations and it's not a place where they want to stay. We know through the greater MSP work that um, we're not retaining young people of color at the same rates as their white counterparts. And so uh, our work can't just be with the scholars. Um, the work extends beyond that to our partners and their organizations and we'll continue to do that work in, into 2019. Um, we hope uh, we will continue to do this work. We're hoping that we will place more scholars working um, with the organizations to make sure that when we recruit that there are the opportunities afterwards for them to stick around. And we're going to continue to make process improvements based on the um, employee, uh, based on the evaluation that we just underwent to make this a program that is really something supervisors can use and the scholars. Some challenges, staffing capacity. Our program has grown from eight to 118, um, and our staff has our staff size has stayed the same. Um, another issue that we have is that because we're uniquely placed in civil rights, we're not HR. Um, it makes it difficult to place students afterwards. And so in the case of Jasmine, she is a temporary employee. She donated um, so much time through her facilitation training. She's served on our ambassador, um, as an ambassador for our program. And we invested in her for four years and we don't have a position for her. Um, and so we will continue to work alongside HR and departments to make sure that the positions that we're placing scholars in are not just just kind of secondhand work are not just these positions of like nice to have work, but are really um, training up these young people to fill the positions that we know will be um, open. Um, 
The final piece is just maintaining our brand. Uh, the students, we've heard overwhelmingly from them that it matters um, that they have Urban Scholar on their resume. And so as we expand both internally, as we expand to other partner organizations, and as they try to make the program fit their organization, um, we believe that it's essential to make sure that that racial equity and that social justice lens is woven throughout, no matter who's uh, hosting, no matter who is um, leading this work within those organizations. Um, we want people to see urban scholars on a resume and know what's behind those words. Um, and with that, I will stand for questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues? Council Vice President Jenkins. Wow, well, I guess I can't resist an opportunity to just continue to be a, a huge cheerleader for the Urban Scholars Program, and in my previous role as a policy aide, we hired one of those eight <laughs> urban scholars um, early on, and it made a tremendous impact on me and 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 our office. And then, you know, subsequently, I was invited to come and speak to the Urban Scholars. Um, upon the completion of one of the summer programs. And and now I've had uh, the opportunity to hire um, a former urban scholar on my permanent administrative team. And, you know, I think the, she had been a, an urban scholar for two years. Um, and so the, the preparation, uh, the confidence and encouragement that she received um, is really paying off in, in really big dip dividends for me and, and my, and the work that we're trying to do in the Ward 8 office. And, um, you know, I just, I think it's really um, just critical that we continue to do this work. And then Jasmine spoke of creating pathway programs within other departments. And so <clears throat> while these 72 or Hundred and eighteen um, positions alone won't close the gap, but the the ripple effect uh, will certainly play a large role in in closing some of those gaps. So um, I commend you all on your hard work and and commitment to yourselves uh, and and lifting yourselves up and taking advantage of these types of opportunities and. Um, Thanks to the Civil Rights Department and, and your staff and um, you, Ms. Kanye, for your work and helping to bring these young people um, along is really commendable. So thank you. Mr. Chair, Council Vice President, thank you and thank you for your commitment to the program. It's without um, you all creating those uh, meaningful positions and um, that makes it so that these students can come in and actually start to impact change in our in our institutions. So thank you. I have a question or comment from Councilmember Gordon. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate the report. I um, I think back in uh, 2011 or whenever we first passed that racial equity uh, resolution, we um, definitely called out, and it was actually inspired very much by employment disparities, and it led us to that point. And we said we were going to lead by example, and um, I think. We've been doing that with this program in particular, and I really appreciate that. I'm delighted to see such success with it. I was curious about the 72, um, and, and, and first of all, um, that kind of shows that maybe we are leading by example because we started this program in-house, and then it took a few years, and then others were interested enough that we could help them do that. Who are the partners, and does it look like anybody's going to take it up on their own? Maybe I just missed. Oh, there they are at the bottom. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Gordon, um, our partner organizations over the past few years have been the Minneapolis Public uh, Public Schools, um, the Minneapolis, uh, the Metropolitan Airports Commission, United Way, the State of Minnesota, and. 19 of their agencies, the fourth, fourth judicial courts, um, the Park Board, Hennepin County, and the Metropolitan Council, um, and. Those are our partners. They all have varying numbers of participants in their program. Right now, Metropolitan Council is the um, 
only organization that manages their own cohort. Um, and we, in our process with the evaluation and our strategic planning process, are looking at what does sustainable growth look like. Um, and that includes looking at our partnership structure. Um, many of these organizations will never have the capacity to have an entire cohort of 15 to 20 students. And we found that in the literature and what makes our program so um, special is that cohort model of training. And so um, we are looking at ways to uh, um, to help organizations adapt and adopt the program um, in ways that work for them, but that still maintain that brand and that quality of training. So they're managing their own program, but that still includes the 72, but they just have a big enough cohort that they operate separately and outside of our cohort? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Goodman, yes, that, uh, Councilmember Gordon, that is, that's correct. Um, Metropolitan Council has a very robust internship program. Um, we've actually seen results that since they've taken on Urban Scholars, their other internship uh, program has increased uh, in diversity. Their pool of candidates has become extremely diverse in comparison to where they were prior to the program. Um, and they have a, taken our program um, and our materials and they are um, administering their cohort in-house, that's correct. Have, have we given any thought to replicating this program for other levels of work, if that makes any sense to you? So we, we definitely want to diversify all sorts of divisions. You don't necessarily think about urban scholars as maybe fitting with uh, um, the beginning level of public works or maybe even the police department, as being a police officer or a firefighter, and I know they have their pathways and all of that, but I'm not sure if they have cohorts, I'm not sure if they have the same kind of training and support system as this have. Have you been communicating and are we looking at if we could broaden the model kind of, uh, not so much urban scholar, but urban, uh, I'm not sure. Um, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Gordon, uh, great question. We are, um, again, with uh, staff capacity at what it is. Um, I'm always dreaming and we're always trying to find ways to expand our programming. Um, there's a lot of really great work going on um, around pathways and in uh, individualized internship programs and my staff and I are in constant communication with um, those different folks. Um, for example, uh, the EMS Pathways program that Erica Prosser runs, our urban scholars come in in the summer and provide support for them. And so our scholars are taking a lot of the materials that we use, um, that, that cohort model to try to bring those students together and create and foster that same kind of environment. So um, in terms of looking at other places that it can be replicated, um, we are always looking into that. All right, well, thank you. Great, thank you. I just want to also throw out there, because I was thinking, for example, about the city assessor having a pathway program for city assessors um, and would love to be able to figure out ways to be able that the council can be of support with making the connections between those various pathway programs in the different uh, departments. Um, I did have a question. The original budget request for Urban Scholars was 150,000, 30,000 was included. Can you explain what the ask for 150,000 was? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mr. Chair, council members, um, my initial budget uh, was based on um, wage increases. Uh, currently, um, the state of Minnesota, who is one of our, I would say our biggest competitor in terms of placements um, for scholars, uh, pays their scholars $18.62 an hour. Uh, we start our scholars at 16. So that $30,000 is to just bring those 23 positions up to be competitive with our largest competitor, which is the state of, of Minnesota. Um, that's still under um, many of our uh, public or our, our private corporation internships. Um, Target starts their folks at 19, 3M is at, I believe, 21. Cargill is at $22 an hour. Um, it was also in response to, as, as the minimum wage goes up, we wanna make sure that um, we're valuing the work that these young people are doing, because this isn't just pushing papers, this is high-level professional work that they're um, contributing to and leading. Um, the other asks were related to um, the 50 requests that I received this year for placement. We weren't able to place scholars in all of them. Um, and a substantial amount of time for um, my staff and I were working with departments on scraping together funds to um, place those 46. There is a want and a need to um, 
place scholars, but my budget only allows 23. So uh, a chunk of that 150 was to be able to provide at least one scholar to every department, plus to every council office if they so, so wish. Um, and then the remainder of those dollars, um, we have a number of nonprofit partners across the, the metro who are interested in supporting this work and in hosting urban scholars. Um, we've had requests from arts organizations like the MIA, the Walker, the um, Minnesota Opera, um, all the way to some of our, um, our other partners in our work. So NEON, Emerge, uh, Project for Pride in Living, these are all organizations that would love to partner with us, um, but don't have the funds. And so the additional dollars were to um, replicate the step up model, which is for those nonprofits to help subsidize wages, uh, to allow there to be a nonprofit focus because that work is so, is so aligned with what um, the public sector is trying to do. And we can't do it without our nonprofit partners. Um, and so that was what the additional funds were for, is to start a nonprofit cohort um, in subsidizing wages. Well, thank you for that clarification. I, I just, if I can, just real quick, I want to say that I, I feel like it's important, and this is really to my colleagues, I think it's important for us to be intentional about paying um, people who work for the city and at the city well, when we see that 88% of program participants are young people of color, we have to be intentional about paying them well um, and and reflecting back that work is appreciated and and seen. So I just wanna throw that out there for us to, to really take into consideration. Um, I have a question or comment from Council Member Cano. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've had the pleasure of hosting uh, Urban Scholars at our office before, and we've had to learn sort of how to integrate that um, energy and talent into our office because everything's so fast moving and the projects are so different day to day. And, um, you know, on the city council end of it, you might wake up thinking this is my work plan for the day and you get into the office and it completely changes based on an emergency that's happening or a motion that's being brought forward. So um, I, I have a lot of respect for for the urban scholars that have worked with the council before because I think it is kind of a different um, type of organizational culture um, that, that is not the easiest to navigate. But I just wanted to kind of put a couple of things on the table and see if we can kind of work on these things, obviously not here, but as the program develops. Um, one thing that I've noticed is um, I think the um, importance to s more more specifically solidify the notion of networking with within the cohorts because um, I've I've seen that it takes a while for for me to sort of. Uh, get through to to the interns this this notion that you're in a very uh, well connected, well resourced environment, and that notion of networking is really important. And so, would love to see that fortified in the curriculum somehow. Um, just as a reminder, you know, if if you guys have sessions every week or every month, just to check in and, and say, you know, how are things going? Because I've had to personally sit down with my urban scholars and say like, have you set out a one-on-one -on -one with so-and-so this week? And can you make sure you have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody else every week? So that component of it is, is interesting to me that how the networking piece happens and is valued and supported. The other component was um, the notion of community involvement. And so talking about how an eight to five is not going to necessarily lead to an eight to five, especially in this kind of work. Um, and maybe I'm talking very specific, specifically about the city council kind of political end of things where um, many of us didn't you know, necessarily get this job by just showing up to an eight to five, but it's connected to all of the neighborhood groups that you go to, all of the community work that you do, all of the issues that you advance, all of the sort of clubs and sort of efforts that you're a part of. And so I've also had to kind of do some more of, of that mentoring with with our interns um, because it's different than if you want to be like a uh, engineer you know a traffic engineer where you just you know you go to school and then the the line to that type of work is very clear and direct whereas with some of these other things especially as you look at jobs at the neighborhood and community relations office if you look at the ways that we're trying to rethink policing 
if you're looking at uh, things that the health department is doing, there's just so many connections to things that happen outside of that 5 p.m. deadline. And even in the community over the weekends when it comes to community festivals and business development and growth for communities of color, all of those things really connect. And so I'd love to also explore what that looks like in the curriculum moving forward. And then lastly, I just I was curious about this component of, um, I know you all have trainings that kind of um, prof maybe professional training that happen regularly or, or sessions where you all get together to study or analyze a topic. I'd be curious to know your thinking around um, what would it take to actually use those sessions to produce some kind of a formal certificate in either conflict management or project management, something that, that the individual can walk away with and, and show to any future employer, whether it's government or private sector or nonprofit or schools where... Um, you know, let's say instead of being four sessions by four different guest speakers on like, what is your job like? Or how did you learn how to do it? It's more like here are four sessions on conflict management. And at the end of this, you're going to be like a conflict management, like trained person or something like that. So I'm just kind of brainstorming on that because I don't know enough about how many sessions you would have per year to accomplish that. But for example, one thing I see in our team is the ability to, you know, just have like the social media communication skills pat, you know, having them have that be really down uh, on your resume or um, list of expertise, as well as project management, because we just manage so many different things within the city that any organization would love to have, I think, somebody who can say, I've had 12 sessions on project management, and this is, and I know how to do it, and here, here's my certificate. So I'm just curious about what that conversation looks like within your realm of work and what you're thinking about how to utilize those sessions um, in a, maybe in a different way. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember Cano, thank you for that feedback, and I would be happy to follow up with you on um, how um, some of the work we're already doing aligns with your thoughts there. Um, I will say that um, one of the things that I've worked really intentionally on um, at the behest of Director Corbel is returning scholars. Um, and when I took the program over, there was about a 2% uh, return rate. Um, in the past three years, we've seen almost 50% of scholars want to return. Um, and what that has resulted in is tiered programming. And so the training that students get their first year is really foundational. Um, and we don't, um, again, you don't need to have had a job or you don't need to have had professional experience to get an internship. And so um, at a certain point, we, we kind of have to do a baseline. So we do things like dress for success and time management training. Um, and while most of our students don't need it, we set a really good foundation. Um, but when students come back their second year, they do get project management training. Um, and um, we are within our evaluation, our strategic planning process, um, looking into ways to um, have a more formal certificate um, where it's recognized and approved by whether it's the Institute for Professional Development or if it's sponsored by one of our schools, but some sort of certificate um, that captures those leadership and professional development skills. Um, and I will I would be happy to follow up with you um, to kind of capture some of your ideas to see what other options might be be in there. Yes, project management skills are really needed um, in the public sector. No shade, a little bit of shade, a little bit of grace. Um, but I just want to say that I've had the opportunity for my time being in the city, I've had the opportunity to work with three different urban scholars. Um, and my last urban scholar played a really crucial role in the license on conduct, the, the conduct on licensed premises overhaul, which my colleagues uh, have seen recently a presentation on how robust that was. So shout out. Um, and also, I just have to say that one of the, the great parts that I got to experience as a supervisor who worked with an urban scholar is the level of pride that I have that she was hired by the council vice president. Like that's pretty fancy. And so I feel like, all right, you know, so it's really nice to also be able to um, help support leadership and help young folks be able to um, step into really cool positions, working for really cool people, doing really cool things. So I uh, so just wanted to say that and say thank you for all of your leadership because you stepped into this program and, and have turned it into what it looks like. And uh, what it looks like is very brown, which is exciting because we don't necessarily see that reflected as the numbers showed. And so you, what you are doing, we need to replicate. <laughs> um, 
not only with internships, but as we hire here at the city. And so I think there's lots of good lessons to be learned. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this in detail with us. Do any of my colleagues have any other questions or comments? Oh, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Before you adjourn, I just wanted to acknowledge Zoe Bougere, who just stepped into the room. Um, full-time city of Minneapolis employee and Ward 8 staff person, so Yay. give us a wave, Zoe. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. All right, thank you so much. So, seeing no further comments or questions, I receive, I move to receive and file this item. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. And that, uh, that item is received and filed. Uh, I just want to say if there's anybody still watching at home, good for you. Um, if you are still listening, uh, make sure that you get involved by calling your council members on issues that matter to you. Check out the Minneapolis LIM system, L-I-M-S, to be able to learn more about the decisions and things that are coming before the city council. And thank you for being here and being involved. And on that note, this meeting is adjourned.